Hello and welcome to us. This week, the autumn statement fallout and where we are with devolution, plus a little later on. The Docklands Light Railway is to be run by the French and the Spanish. Why are UK firms apparently being beaten on the track? Here with me, Greg Hans for the Conservatives and Gareth Thomas uh, for Labour. Welcome to you both. Thank you. And let's kick off with the uh, surprise reform of stamp duty announced by the Chancellor in that autumn statement. And in short, uh, what it will mean for the capital. It's time we fundamentally change this badly designed tax on aspiration. So I am today abolishing the residential slab system altogether. In, in future, each rate will only apply to the part of the property price that falls within that band, like income tax. So what does that mean for London? For an average house in the capital, valued at £510,000, stamp duty will fall from 20000 to 15500 but for a house valued at a million pounds, stamp duty will rise from £40,000 to £43,750. It's a policy which many see as aimed at taking on Labour in key London marginal seats in next May's election, where Ed Miliband's proposal for a so-called mansion tax would have to be paid annually on the most expensive properties. So, Gareth Thomas, uh, a reform of property taxation here to um, trump the mansion tax. Well, I don't think it does uh, trump the, the mansion tax. We've got to raise uh, more money to pay for the National Health Service. I think most people in London will recognise that the NHS is under huge pressure. So we do need the uh, mansion tax. Uh, but we will support the reforms to uh, stamp duty. And we actually welcome the fact that the Chancellor of the Exchequer is now recognising that uh, the most expensive um, properties, the most highest uh, valued, are not properly taxed, which is the very point that we're making with the mansion tax. Unfortunately, Stamp duty reform is going to cost the taxpayer uh, significant uh, sums of money. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we need the mansion tax to help raise money for us to invest in the NHS. If it's a good idea to uh, reform the stamp duty, why hadn't you suggested you were going to do it before uh, the Chancellor did? Well, it's not been our priority. We've said we need to raise money to pay for the NHS. We think that the mansion tax is a uh, is a fair tax, as it will hit properties over £2 million in uh, value and will raise significant sums of money, which we can put into one of the most important public services, which, as Londoners know, is under huge pressure. Greg Hans, uh, it indicates and realises that Labour were on the right track, thinking about the value that was there sitting in property and needed to be taxed in some way. And at last, your party has responded. Well, it's it's fundamentally different. I mean, two things to say about the stamp duty reforms. Uh, first of all, it's incredibly welcome conservative reform uh, to better design a tax without the slab system. So it's much, uh, uh, you, you remove the glitches in terms of the amount of tax that's paid, which isn't really in proportion uh, at particular points. The second thing to make clear is that 98% of people in Britain will benefit uh, from this refor reform in terms of when they buy a home, it's going to be cheaper uh, than it was the case uh, prior to uh, this week. And in in London that figure is 91%. So 91% of home buyers uh, in London will benefit uh, from these very important reforms. What about in your own constituency? How many will benefit It's there? about 50-50 in my own constituency. Mm -hmm. um, opinion is a little bit mixed of course on that, but overall in terms of the national interest, in terms of the London interest, it's going to make property much more affordable for people. But how, it's but going to hit in your constituency a lot, you recognise in that well, well, uh, right, don't you? I mean, well, certainly Labour's mansion tax. Be, be straight on this for a moment, just how much, how much is this going to affect? You know you're in one of the wealthiest, the wealthy probably, the wealthiest boroughs in Kensington and Chelsea, part of your, your seat. This is going to hit that borough harder than anywhere else, isn't it? Well, it's going to make some property transactions more expensive, but it's going to make half of the property transactions in both Kensington and Chelsea, and even more so in Hammersmith and Fulham, cheaper. So there'll be some winners and there'll be some losers on this. But everybody would be a loser under Labour's homes tax proposal, which they're proposing, they say, on two million. David Lammy, one of their London mayor contenders, says below one million. And that will be an annual levy on people, regardless of the ability to pay. The important thing about stamp duty well, is that it's a tax at the point of purchase, rather than somebody who might have been living in that home for 20 or 30 years having Gareth, to pay an annual amount. Let's, Gareth, let's just clear, clear that point up. As I say, we, we will support the uh, reforms to stamp duty, but we still need to raise <coughs> significant additional resources to invest in uh, public services, such as the National uh, Health Service, which is why it's fair 
that we do uh, look at increasing the tax on properties over the value of £2 million. So the vast majority of Londoners will not be uh, hit by the mansion tax. And I think it is right that we ask those who are living in the most expensive uh, houses, the highest value houses, the Hyde Park penthouses, etc., to pay a little bit more to make sure that the public services that we all depend on, such as London's National Health Service, can be properly funded. It's deeply unpopular. I mean, actually, a lot of London Labour MPs are now coming out against Labour's home tax. Uh, some of the London mayor candidates as well, because they know that it isn't practical uh, for a start, and secondly, it's going to clobber people who, for no fault of their own, have been living in a home for perhaps 20, 30 years, uh, they bought it some time ago, who would be forced to pay amounts anything up to £30,000 a year simply to live in the home that they have been living in for some years. It's totally different to the stamp duty, which is paid at the point of purchase, uh, which is clearly very different and much it's more very affordable. It's an entirely practical point. I mean, it's been looked at by the, uh, by the Treasury. Uh, there's analysis being done by the Treasury, which shows that it can be delivered in an effective way and in a uh, fair way. And without it, we face uh, the risk of the NHS continuing to be in the sort of state of crisis that it is at the moment. Well, the quick government point has on guaranteed a, a, improved a, NHS a, funding of the whole course of the next point on the A quick point on the wider message that was coming out of, um, of that statement, which is, you know, uh, the austerity that is yet to come. You know, 55 billion cuts, some people will say, still have to happen. We've only had 35 billion. What are you going to be telling your constituents? You know, hang on here with us. We're trying our best, but it's going to hurt. I'm going to be telling my constituents that thanks to our long-term economic plan, um, the country is turning around. Uh, we've got uh, the UK economy is growing faster than any major Western economy. Uh, employment is at a record high. Unemployment is falling uh, very, very so rapidly. Are you going to tell them about Inflation that? Inflation very, very low. You're not going to tell them about that. So the bank. backdrop, uh, Tim, is very, very positive. What I'm going to say to them is don't give the car, the keys back to those who crash the but car. Will you tell in the them about place. any of the pain? Labor. So the stuff that's going to happen to the local well, authorities yes, well, and the uh, transport system and the police. We're going to be saying to people that actually we, we have introduced a lot of savings uh, over the last five years. We've got the deficit down to almost half of what it was when we took over. But there's still a lot to be done. There's a lot of work to be done to make sure that we eliminate the deficit entirely and we do it in a fair way. And of course there is, we talk uh, about There is a lot of work to be done to eliminate the deficit and actually the government have made it worse. George uh, Osborne has missed every single right. target on borrowing. Gav Thomas, they're just going to say people on the doorstep are going to say well you've virtually accepted. You've accepted it this is what has to be done. Well, Nobody wants we, we, balls have, we have accepted that we've got to bring the deficit down. We will take longer to bring that uh, deficit down than uh, George Osborne will do, because we think in that way we can avoid some of the horrendous, colossal uh, oh. cuts just, to public expenditure, which the IFS okay. set out that first was first necessary. Let, let's yeah. just, uh, Ed one, Balls and Ed Miliband were Gordon one, Brown's key one last Treasury item, very briefly. They created One last the item briefly. There seems to have been quite clearly a move in terms of devolution, and we've seen over the last few weeks stuff going to, for instance, you know, Northern Powerhouse, in Greater Manchester, we've seen London asking for it a lot. Nothing, no indication in here of any kind of tax raising powers, any additional dev devolutionary power in London. Why not? Well, there has been an increase in London devolution since the creation of the London Mayor. Oh, and certainly not? we are open um, to looking at uh, further reforms. We have a very, very good London Mayor in Boris Johnson who's doing a great job. And I know he talks to the government all the time, as do his deputy mayors, about key further reforms. And unfortunately, Labour aren't making any kind of firm promises that we see either. Well, we've made clear that we will, for example, allow any increase in the growth of business rates revenue to come down to, uh, to London. We've made clear that we'll uh, devolve uh, training and education, uh, uh, further education funding down to a, a London level. So we have begun begun to set out some of the additional powers that we think but you need have to, be to break hands. We talk about the stamp duty reform, but you won't allow that stamp duty money, which is being you know raised, to be put back into house building in London, dictated by a mayor or local authorities. Real devolution, proper localism. Well, well the government is actually seeing uh, a lot more house building. Uh, London has saw, seen a lot more house building under Boris Johnson. Uh, and of that course, we, we will look at further. We won't go down that debate. We will look at we further devolution proposals as they get made. All right. Okay. Uh, before we finish with the uh, autumn statement, something that may just interest you, uh, we wonder uh, who was the speaker giving a firm telling off to during Ed Balls's response to the autumn statement. And the same goes, Oda, and the same goes. And I've been looking at him and listening to him for the government's deputy oh, chief no. whip. <laughs> And let me make it clear to the honourable gentleman, he ought to know better. Behave or get out, man. 
And we are looking at him now really firmly. You know, the culprit. That was you, wasn't it? Uh, I think the speaker was referring to me. Um, it's quite at you. <laughs> a, uh, a noisy uh, chamber, as it often is at uh, budget occasions, autumn statements, uh, Prime Minister's question time. Uh, and uh, yes, I think in terms of the co clear contrast between George Osborne and David Cameron, I think you were probably uh, and Ed Miliband and, were you, and were you just making that in very civil terms? What were you actually saying? Can you you're remember what you were shouting? You were probably cheering uh, well, Ed I think Balls I was saying uh, to Ed Balls that he should uh, apologise uh, for the dreadful state that he left this country's finances Bellowing in. Apology, now apology. he is. Now he's. Uh, effectively trying to pretend he's got a clean slate and he's never been uh, in this position before and I think he should lay out very first of all that he should apologize for the disgraceful state that he left this country. See, you see, just on the point of, but you could see that from the speaker's point of view you were being less than decorous or whatever, <laughs> in your behavior or what you were doing during that speech. Do you accept that? Well, uh, but what, what, I, what I do accept is that I think that Ed Ball should apologise, and I think it's a reasonable item of debate as to whether he should apologise for the appalling condition. A more he useful, left the a more, <laughs> on, a more useful Brief. heckle might have been to ask George Osborne where the axe is going to fall. You know, where is it going to fall in uh, in council spending? Where is it going to fall in Why the police? Why did he uh, get uh, uh, fall fall Han uh, Hansard does not record whether you came up with that heckle, Gareth Thomas. <laughs> Another time. Where maybe. are Labour? Next year, where to fall under Labour? Anyway, we better move on. The Docklands Light Railway is to be run over the next few years by a consortium part owned by France's National Railway. This concession appears to reflect a wider trend indicating that a government opposed to the railways being in public hands is happy to see them being in the public hands of uh, other countries. Andrew Cryan reports. The Docklands Light Railway, probably the most picturesque part of London's metro system and as of today operated by a partnership called Keolis Amy one half of which is proving increasingly controversial. Now the interesting thing about Keolis is they're actually owned by the French National Railways and Quebec's pension fund. So, if the point of privatisation was that the British government was too inefficient to run the railways, why are contracts being awarded to bids from foreign governments? The DLR is just one small part of the story. According to research from the RMT Trade Union, the red lines on this map represent those private rail routes in the UK operated by companies partly or wholly owned by foreign governments. In all, that's 20 out of 28 operating in Britain. And according to the union, in some cases our fares are being used to subsidise other countries' transport systems. These people are licking their lips. You've got a quote here from the Department of Transport in Germany who said that uh, they come over and get the cash cow from the British Railways so they can keep uh, fares and invest, on the, keep fares low and invest on the German Railways. What an absolutely appalling decision. Good evening. The government's published its plans to break up and privatise British Rail. The, the railways were first privatised by John Major's government in the mid-1990s. But the fact that the British private sector is putting in bids for contracts which the state deems less competitive than offers from other countries' governments poses a question about exactly how efficient our private sector is. It would appear that the freewheeling British approach to entrepreneurship and creating companies hasn't produced companies capable of competing with French railways or Dutch railways through their subsidiaries in this country, which is pretty amazing and, you know, worthy of study. In fact, it's not just the trains where this is happening. London's buses are also run by private companies. So, according to Transport for London, over a third of our bus services are run by companies which are subsidiaries of foreign governments. So, for example, we've got one here, which is run by a subsidiary of the Dutch government. We've even got three companies which are owned by the French equivalent, the Parisian Transport for London. The irony is, of course, that Transport for London themselves aren't allowed to bid for any of these services. But according to former Transport Minister Norman Baker, at least when it comes to the railways, allowing our government to bid for contracts might well be difficult. If you want the state to be able to bid for each franchise um, uh, to compete with other organisations, that would require a section of the Department for Transport to be set up. It's expensive bidding for a franchise and of course most bidders by definition lose, so there could be a question mark over whether the government was wasting money by allowing itself to bid for a franchise. There's a second question as well as to whether or not it's right for the Department for Transport, which at the moment decides which franchise is let, to be able to be judge and jury on itself. But, at least according to opinion polls, the British people's favoured solution to all this is not tweaking the system to let the state bid for contracts, but a full-scale renationalisation of the railways. 
Andrew Cryan uh, reporting there. Joining uh, me is Christian Woolmer, journalist and uh, transport expert, uh, but also the first man to throw his hat into the ring in terms of uh, Labour's uh, attempt to find a new cabinet to, find, uh, to fight the election, the mayoral election next year. Anyway, let's talk about the DLR and rail today. Um, is there a problem? Are there any issues raised about the DLR being run as a concession by Fran French Spanish-owned companies? Well, it is very odd that uh, British government agencies are not allowed to bid uh, for franchises, and French and uh, Dutch and German ones are. And they have an advantage over the British companies that Tony Travers were talking about. They have access to relatively cheap capital uh, as a government, as our government would. So uh, they're allowed to uh, bid for these franchises and take the profits out of the country. And indeed, German Railways annual report boasts that uh, it doesn't actually invest very much over here through Arriva, the company it owns, uh, but it takes all the money and invests it in the German railway system. So we are paying for investment in the German railway system. On the DLR though, which is a concession where, where Transport for London said we are going to put this line out for this price and we still control the fares and everything our end but we want an operator to come and do it for that price um, what's wrong if this French and Spanish consortium was the best deal, the cheapest, and can show that they're good enough? Well, there's still a uh, profit to be made there, and it's a shame that that profit uh, is uh, going outside uh, and uh, to France and not staying uh, within our own economy. And but English uh, companies does... could bid for it, though. English consortium to run, couldn't they? But as I say, even with a, a contract like uh, the Docklands Lake Railway, uh, these uh, foreign state-owned companies companies have an advantage. They don't have transparent accounts. You know, it's all melded in with uh, uh, the state. It's completely unfair. Quite apart from the fact that, you know, in a sensible world, I think we ought to be uh, renationalizing, taking back in-house our own railways. Why would we go and do that? Well, I think that uh, essentially uh, railways are a public service, uh, they require a lot of subsidy and uh, it seems odd that companies are allowed to make a chunk of profit out of uh, a service that is uh, subsidised and is a public service. Greg Hans, answer that. Doesn't make sense. Well, I think actually privatised railways have been a great success over the last 20 years, first of all. Secondly, I think the DLR has been a, a great success uh, in terms of the Conservative government that brought it to London in the late 1980s. I don't think we should get ideological about who runs the companies. It's done on a competitive uh, tender uh, where everybody can bid on a level playing field and as far as I understand it, Transport for London chooses the best bidder who will provide the best service to passengers. And what matters to me is not so much the ownership of the company or who's operating the railway, so long as they fulfil what is set out in the contract, but the quality of the service they provide to customers. But you said, my you said there shouldn't be has, ideology well, my, involved. My, well, but, but there is ideology. The ideology is that private is better than public. It's not something that, that I believe, and I think the public doesn't believe. Rail renationalisation well, would be enormously popular. Well, it, it may be, but I don't, I don't think it would actually be the right answer. And my constituents, my const I have a higher proportion of tube users in my constituency than, than anywhere else in, in London. And my constituents care most of all about efficient service, reliable service, and speedy service. They aren't actually fussed about the, the nationality of the But the tube the is a public service. service. And, and again, but, 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 but those constituents, like mine, are also very concerned about uh, tube fares, which have rocketed under, under Boris. But you I wouldn't do anything about, you wouldn't do anything I, differently from the way you that they would tackle this franchising well, and the, concession question, process. But on you? the question of the franchising, I think what's interesting is the East Coast Main Line is uh, a, a public uh, body. It's a UK public body. And it was running the East Coast Main Line in a very profitable and, if, and effective way. The government has actually decided that they want to put the East Coast Main Line tender out uh, to competition. Won't allow the current, uh, if very effective, body that is running uh, that, uh, that, that line and bringing profits back into the Treasury to continue um, to do so. So it's very clear that there is, uh, as, uh, uh, as has been said, ideology at work here, stopping a public body, but you're a, a UK public body, from being allowed to bid but and continue to run, run the East Coast mainland. But you're a Labour mayoral candidate where your party is not committing, as you presumably like them to do, to renationalisation. Well, they're, they're, they are committed to a franchise review, a review of the whole franchising process. Uh, and they are committed to having a uh, 
public sector bidder for every franchise. I hope that in that franchise review, which is going to be extensive, I understand, they will come to the conclusion that certainly it will be a good idea to have many franchises in the public sector to allow us to compare them with the efficiency of the private sector. Because, as Gareth says, the East Coast has been a great success. OK, well, it's uh, good to see you, Christian Wilmer. Thanks very much indeed. Now for the rest of the news in 60 seconds. Boris Johnson wants greater powers devolved to London to allow him to oversee the criminal justice system in the capital. The plans would introduce a New York style system where the mayor holds to account those responsible for the process, starting from investigation and arrest through to charging, prosecution and sentencing. During his trip to the Far East, the mayor's Malaysian-backed Battersea Paris station scheme came under fire over the number of affordable homes it will provide for Londoners. So there will be loads of new homes uh, for people who are on uh, modest incomes. 500 new buses will be brought into use on London's roads to cope with the population growth, Transport for London has said. Investment of £200 million will also be earmarked for improving the reliability of the bus service. A planned cultural and education centre at the Olympic Park is to receive £141 million worth of funding. The spending was announced in the National Infrastructure Plan, which was published this week ahead of the Chancellor's autumn statement. Gareth Thomas, let's ask you first about that. Even despite difficult financial times, commitment to 500 more buses looking to the future, this is a government and a mayor that is being able to provide this kind of investment. I'm not sure Labour could match it, could they? Well, it's, it is good to see investment in uh, in buses. They're probably the most common, commonly used form of public transport in the uh, in the UK. I think the downside of uh, what Boris has done on uh, buses and tubes has been a huge rise in fares, uh, almost sixty percent rise in uh, in tube fares since he came to power. Right. The worry is that that will continue. Okay, and we think that fares wouldn't increase under Labour because of the similar financial envelope. They would, wouldn't they? They'd have to, to you know, to a greater or lesser degree. Well, I hope they wouldn't actually have to go up uh, by anything like uh, okay, but as we know much. the word hope. I want to ask um, uh, uh, um, uh, Mr Hans here while you're here. This plan, we talked about a little bit about devolution earlier, but the idea of perhaps police or, or, or other parts of the criminal justice system coming over to the mayor, probation service and so on, would that make sense? Well, I think it's something that should be looked at. I mean, the proposal has been made by Stephen Greenhouch, uh, who is Boris's excellent uh, deputy mayor on crime and policing. He did a fantastic job as the leader of Hammersmith of the Fulham Council. And he's made these proposals, and I think they should be given um, serious study. Can I just come back to buses, though, for a moment? Because one of the reasons we are able to provide uh, additional buses and additional public services is due to the way that we've run the economy over the last four and a half years. And we have a long-term economic plan, and we are able to provide, thanks to good stewardship of the public's money, um, provide more public services more as a borrowed, result of economic uh, Greg, growth I mean, and, uh, and running the country's finance as well. It's been a, uh, uh, a running theme through this um, part of the programme this week. Um, uh, no worse for it than that, but um, thanks very much indeed to you both. Andrew, back to you.